In the last video that I uploaded, uh, we had a look at how to draw uh, very proportionate cubes in perspective. And basically we did that using an ellipse. It's a very reliable method. So if you haven't watched that video, watch that one now. In this video, we're going to have a look at how we can actually reverse engineer that method. All right. Uh, so the method that we're going to be doing in this video, we're kind of working a little bit backwards, not working backwards, but just starting off uh, in a different area. Uh, but this way of working is way more beneficial for when you're actually trying to compose the image and actually place it on the page. So stick around as I show you how to do that one. Okay, so this is where we left off on the last video. Basically, I explained to you the theory of using the ellipse in perspective drawing. Uh, so I'll give you a quick rundown of that one. If you're trying to draw a perfect square in perspective, then you're going to need to use an ellipse. And an ellipse is a circle in perspective. Um, you can watch the full video if you need a breakdown of that. But basically the idea is that the lines that are traveling off the tangent of the circle are traveling to distant vanishing points. So we can use the tangencies of the circle to locate uh, you know, where the vanishing points are on the horizon line. And by using this method, uh, we don't need a, to draw a horizon line. Uh, we don't need to draw measuring points or auxiliary measuring points or any of that. Um, we can literally just jump straight into the drawing. So I've done a couple more cube drawings. Uh, this one was using the same method as last time. Um, I really wish I did a recording of this one since I like the look of this better than this one. <laughs> um, uh, that's just how it goes sometimes. You always tend to draw a little bit better when you're not filming. But exact same method as the last one. This little one down here actually uh, went ahead and used a slightly different method. And this is the method that I'm going to be teaching you today. So basically what I did was I placed my square first and then I drew the ellipse inside of it. So I actually worked backwards. And then once I had the ellipse drawn, I then used the ellipse to construct the cube. Now, why would I do that? Why would I work in that way? Well, because for compositional purposes, it's much, much better. This is a trickier way of working. So if you're still not used to this one, um, keep practicing it because this one is actually a little bit harder to do. But if you can master this, then it's going to make your life a lot easier when it comes to actually placing objects inside uh, on, onto the paper. So the problem, the only real problem with this method is the drawing always ends up a little bit bigger than you anticipated. And well, there's a reason for that. If you have a look at the circle, you can see the tangencies of the square hit the circle, but then the corners of the square uh, extend far beyond it. And that's what's happening in the perspective drawing. You can see here, I've got my ellipse down this way, and here's the extreme ends of the ellipse. But the extreme ends of the cube are here and here. So the drawing always ends up a little bit bigger than you anticipated. Now, most of the time, it's not a problem. You just kind of roll with it and you just make sure that you take that into account when beginning a drawing. However, if you're working on a much more finished drawing on a much more, you know, finished kind of illustration and everything has to be placed perfectly in it, well then you can go ahead and use this method that I'm going to teach you right now. So let's jump straight into it. So with this method, I'm going to start just by drawing a horizontal line. Now, 
you don't need to draw this horizontal line, but for the purposes of explaining the concept to you, I'm going to go ahead and use it. I'm going to place two dots on this horizon line. These dots will represent the extreme width of the cube, okay? So from side to side of the entire thing. <clears throat> I'm going to divide the measurement in half. I'm going to verify that by measuring with my pencil. So it's about there. And then I'm going to divide the line into quarters. Okay. So, now to draw the cube. I'm going to extend very lightly a vertical line that travels down. So this is one side of our cube. And here is the other extreme end of the cube over here. So, I know absolutely that the cube is not going to travel outside of that area. It's going to remain within it. Again, with this method, the cube always ends up traveling just outside the ellipse. So the drawing always ends up a little bit bigger than you anticipated. Usually that's not much of a problem, but sometimes it is is why we're going to use this method today. <clears throat> so I've got my two vertical lines traveling down. And I've got four equal spaces. One of these spaces I'm going to use as the front edge of the cube. If we come back to this drawing. This edge is the front edge of the cube. So I'm going to draw a vertical line that travels from this point. Since this is where I would like the front edge of the cube to be placed. I would advise you to draw this quite slowly because it's very easy to uh, get this wrong. Um, if any of your lines are not traveling correctly, if they're not clean enough, if they're not straight enough, um, it's very easy to make mistakes because the mistakes, what typically happens is that the mistakes begin to compound. So basically what I've done is the side of the cube, which is in this region, basically takes up one fourth of the entire width of the object. If you have a look at this drawing, the side face of the cube right here takes up one third of the entire drawing. Again, this is great for compositional purposes because by doing this, you can actually rotate the cube in exactly the position that you want it to. With this method, if we just draw straight from the ellipse and then build a cube on top of it, we've got a vague idea of what the rotation might be, but typically it's gonna end up a little bit different than what we anticipated. If we reverse engineer it like this, we have greater control of what we're doing. Okay, so I'm gonna place a point here. And from this point, this point represents the bottom corner of the cube, which is that bit there, okay? So this corner is the corner that is closest to the viewer. This face is much larger than this face, okay? So therefore, the angle travels at a much flatter direction. And we know that because we can see it. We're seeing much more of this face, and this angle travels at a flatter angle than this one. Also notice where the positions of the corners are. This corner at the bottom is closest to the viewer. This corner, which is traveling at a flatter angle, is the second closest to the viewer. <coughs> and this one, 
where the face is traveling at a steeper angle is the uh, third closest to the viewer. And this corner back here is obviously the furthest away. Now this is very important in order to be able to pull this off. You must understand this and it's, you know, fairly simple stuff, but sometimes it's one of those things in perspective that some of us, especially when we're new to it, we tend to forget these simple things. So coming back to this drawing, I'm going to draw an angle that's relatively flat. That's going to be that face there. This one, however, the face is much narrower. So this one is going to be quite steep. So I'm going to draw it about there. Now, let's explain one more concept. When things travel away from the viewer, they become foreshortened, which we know, because that's what perspective is all about. So to demonstrate that, I'm just gonna quickly draw a plane. So here's a plane of a square or a rectangle, doesn't matter, call it what you want. To find the center, obviously, we find the center by drawing from corner to corner. That is the center in perspective. But the center is not directly in the middle. If you actually find the middle of the height between this line and this line, you'll find that it's probably somewhere around there, just by looking at it but the center in perspective is a little bit further away. That's foreshortening. The same is true for this. If this angle is here, and the front angle is here, then this back angle probably wants to be around here, more or less. See, this is the beauty of this method because it gives you a little bit of flexibility. But you can see, if I extend this line here, this line is much closer to that line than this line is closer to that line. So there's the foreshortening in effect already. And you can choose to extend it a little bit if you want to stretch that out, but because this face is traveling at a very steep angle, might be better to keep it a little bit flatter. See, if I draw this angle too steep, it's going to look like a rectangular prism. It's also going to look distorted as well because that's when those angles start to get very pointy. So I think here is a good position because it takes this into account and it's also a naturalistic looking angle. So let's go ahead and continue. I'm going to draw an angle that's parallel in perspective to this line, which means that it's traveling at a slightly flatter rate because both of those lines are traveling to a distant vanishing point. Just carefully sketching that in. Looks pretty good. These angles are a little bit steeper and the convergence is going to be a little bit more noticeable. And now, 
I'm going to find the center of that plane. Lies about there. Now, I know what some of you guys in the comments are thinking. This is not technically a square because I didn't use a station point. I didn't use a horizon line. I didn't use measuring points. I didn't use auxiliary measuring points. I did not sketch up a cone of vision, blah, 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 all the rest of it. How can I possibly assume that this is a square? Well, and you know what? You'd be correct. This is just a box that I've just whipped up, kind of just because I thought it looks good and it feels right. But remember, I'm going to do that because composition is way more important to me than technical accuracy. However, this is where the ellipse comes in. The ellipse is a powerful tool because what it does is it gives context to the perspective. I'm going to show you what I mean. So let's take these steep angles into consideration and let's extend them so that we've got a better idea of the direction they're traveling in. Let's then draw a cross section that travels through the middle of the square from the center and extend that forward and backward. So we know it's going to be traveling with these ones. And it's very easy to pinpoint because you can really easily tell if it's too steep or too flat. We'll do the same with this one too. So have a look at these two lines and then draw the angle that travels directly in between them. This one's a little easier to estimate because the lines are flatter. So, having a look at those cross sections, we can see that we've got those tangent points for the cube. Let's come back to our horizontal line here and you see the center line. Let's just drop a vertical as straight as we can onto the square. And we'll measure the edges of the square to verify that it is placed in the center. This will be the center for the ellipse that we're about to construct. Remembering that the center of the ellipse is not the same as the center as the square. Very important that you remember that. Now that we've got that, let's sketch a curve from this tangent point to that center vertical line. Now this part of the curve of the ellipse has to be perpendicular to the vertical line. Because this is where it begins to turn this way now. And same on the other side. We've got the tangency here. I can see that it's going to be perpendicular right where that vertical meets it. So you're pretty much good to go to sketch the rest of the ellipse in because you can see where the other tangencies are. But we can do one more thing just to verify the accuracy. So we've got the top of the ellipse here. We've got the bottom of the ellipse here. We're actually going to divide it directly in half. Remember to measure with your pencil to see if that's exactly halfway. 
Remember, we're not drawing the ellipse in perspective. The ellipse is not drawn in perspective. It's not affected by perspective. It's simply a construction tool for our drawing. So therefore, it's not affected by foreshortening, which means that we can find the center simply by measuring. And once you've found that center, you want to extend that line horizontally each way as clean as you can and I'm going to mark that with two dashed lines okay so I'm going to sketch this curve in I must make sure that this curve is traveling nice, uh, nicely and neatly to this tangent point here and then it rapidly curves that's where the ellipse gets really curvy this part of the curve of the ellipse has to be perpendicular to this horizontal axis now I'm going to do the same for the top section and that just fits in Do the same here. This is um, the hardest part of the drawing, is getting that ellipse to fit in that square. Um, if your ellipse looks distorted or uneven or whatever, then you might need to reconsider the angles of your square. Maybe you need to make the square a little bit bigger or it, it could be any number of problems. This is what I was saying. This is harder than the last method that we did. But with practice, you can definitely master it. And it's important that you do master it because it just makes you a better draftsman. It's always good to uh, train the eye. So in order to find the other part of the curve, I'm gonna measure from the edge of the ellipse to the center. And I'm simply going to duplicate that onto the other side onto that horizontal axis there. And then I'm going to just carefully sketch that cone, uh, that curve, curve, not curve, <laughs> sorry. Carefully sketching that curve to meet the tangency. There and there. So this ellipse is it, it just fits into the square, which is good. This means that we can use this square to construct the cube. Um, not all boxes are going to be accommodating, okay? If you feel like you're forcing an ellipse into that box, it, it's probably gonna be better for you to redraw the entire box. But again, it's all about developing an eye for these things. So, we've got our ellipse. Now we can construct the rest of the cube. Now in the last video, uh, I started with uh, basically a cylinder. Uh, in this video, I'm gonna show you something a little bit different. It's a technique that I like to use, and it's, um, it actually speeds up the drawing process, and I find that sometimes it actually looks a little bit better. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna measure the ellipse. Um, this pencil's a bit too small for that, so I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna measure the width of the ellipse, I should say, so you're measuring that horizontal axis, and then what you're going to do is you're going to be placing that horizontal axis on the line, or on the corner I should say, that is closest to the uh, center of the ellipse, since that will get you the most accurate height. So we're taking the width of the ellipse and we're using that as the height for our cube. And I'm placing it on this front corner here, 
because this corner is closest to the center of the ellipse, which means that it's giving me a much more accurate construction or proportion, I should say. So then what I need to do is I need to sketch a line that is traveling in the same direction as these lines. And uh, there's actually quite a simple trick that you can use. I'm going to show you that one. Um, usually I just go for it, but if you want to be a bit more technically accurate, you can do this instead. So what you want to do, you want to extend this line and see where it hits that vertical line. And then what you want to do, you want to take the measurement between this part here and this part on the vertical line and duplicate that onto the vertical line there. And then you're going to have a look at any other vertical line that those lines cross. So we can have a look at this one. This part here and this part here. So I'm looking at this vertical line where these lines cross through it. I'm measuring that and duplicating that there. So basically what I'm doing is I'm drawing a, uh, a perspective grid. Just with dashed lines. I'm drawing a perspective grid without actually drawing the entire grid, right? It's kind of what I'm doing. By doing that, I can actually get a much more accurate idea of where this top corner should be traveling. So it should really be traveling at an angle like that, which to me looks believable enough. But just in case, I'm going to keep my lines nice and light in case I need to change anything. Okay. And I'm just going to do a little bit of cleanup. So there we go. You can also do the same for these lines. Although I do believe that this one's a little bit easier to pinpoint. So on this one, I'm just going to kind of go for it. Just assume that that's traveling that way there. But you can definitely be a lot more accurate with that. I just think for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm going to speed it up. So here's the back corner here. I'm going to draw the vertical line that travels from there. Again, just starting really lightly, getting a feel for it. See, these flatter angles are much easier to predict. And there you have it. There's a very proportionate looking cube in two point perspective. Done completely without a horizon line and vanishing points. 
And this is the uh, method that I use for a lot of my drawings. If it's a more finished drawing, I think I will go through the effort of actually making a perspective grid using this method. Which I can show you in a future video. I'm just going to do a little bit of cleanup. But that's a pretty good looking perspective drawing. And most importantly, it looks like a cube and not like a rectangular prism. But, it is a tricky method to master. So right now I'm just drawing the center of the faces of the cube. Sketching that in. And I really need to sharpen my pencil because it's going blunt and all of my lines are going a little bit fuzzy. Uh, but that's okay. Now I'm going to draw all of those center cross sections of the cube. So I've got a cross section traveling that way. I like drawing the cross sections because it's a great way to verify if all of your angles are traveling correctly and everything looks proportionate. If you're having trouble drawing these horizontal cross sections that travel around the cube, here's a good tip for you. See this edge of the cross section where it hits the edge of the cube? You can divide that in half because vertical lines are not foreshortened. So if I draw from this point through this cross section on the side plane and continue that where it hits this front edge, if I measure that, that should have divided the vertical line perfectly in half, which it has. So that's how I know the cross section is placed correctly and these lines that are traveling from corner to corner are also placed correctly. So that's just like a little quick hack that you can do. Now I'm just going to draw the uh, vertical cross section on the side and then that should be it. So there you go. This is reverse engineering the ellipse method. But we still need the ellipse to give context to the cube itself because the major axis of the ellipse is used for the height of the cube. Just going to do a little bit of light hatching on the side plane and that's basically it. Now, if there's anything I would want to change on this drawing, this angle here, I would probably make that slightly steeper, just because I feel like it's probably a little bit too flat. But then again, the other lines are traveling accordingly. So I don't know, it's just one of those things, but feel free to play around with that method. 
And also bear in mind that I did do this completely freehand, so feel free to criticize it, but you know, freehand drawing is uh, pretty difficult. <laughs> but yeah, um, hopefully this method helps you. Uh, it, does, it certainly helped me when I was doing more architectural forms, when I was drawing like columns, Doric columns, Roman columns, all that stuff. Uh, this is where this really came in handy because placing the image onto the paper first was really, really, really important. Um, so, but you know, at the same time, we still want to get a nice natural looking perspective. So I find that this method is quite a nice compromise. It gives you both composition and it gives you uh, a nice perspective drawing. You know, it's got the depth in there. It's got that natural look. Um, there's no distorted angles. Um, yeah, these angles here, maybe they're a little bit flatter than I wanted them to be. That's okay. That's just practice though. But there you go. There's two different methods um, of drawing cubes in perspective. And why I like these methods so much is because it gives you an accurate representation of a cube every single time. It might not always turn out completely perfect, but you do get good results. And I think it's a lot better than just completely winging it. I also think it's a much better method than overthinking everything and using station points and all that other stuff that I mentioned, because when you're doing that, you don't you're not really thinking much about composition at that point. It kind of just goes out the window. So this is a great method to use if you want to do a perspective drawing and get it done fairly efficiently. Um, that might not have seemed very fast. Uh, I can assure you that I can draw faster than that, but for the purposes of the video, I like to slow it down a little bit. But give it a go and let me know what you think to these two methods. Um, again, if you haven't seen the other cube drawing tutorial, make sure you go watch that one. But yeah, let me know in the comments if this helped you. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to let me know. All right, well, that's about it for this video. So until the next one.